Camp Boy from Teague Lecture. I'm Nick. And this is Sammy. And go Ducks. So we're going to talk about five things today. We're going to talk about what is a critique. We're going to go ahead and go through the pieces of a critique, the kind of necessary um, elements of a critique. We're going to give you a very, very brief philosophy 101 slash glossary. And it is going to be very brief. We will not go through like every word that you could ever possibly need to know to understand how critiques work. But we're going to talk about the words that really matter for this critique in particular. We're going to talk a little bit about how to actually read a critique, how to go for a critique, kind of some strategy moves, types of arguments you can read. We'll then talk about how to answer a critique while you are affirmative. And then we'll talk about the militarization critique that was given in the packet. But first, debate 101. And we start with this because it's really important for understanding how the critique functions because it tends to call into question a lot of the things that you assume already about how debate works. So first thing to remember about debate generally, this is again universally true because this is debate 101, but it is particularly important when thinking about critiques. There are only two rules to debate which is don't flip cards, and you have to follow speech types. If you flip cards, you will lose. That is a universal truth of debate. And if you decide to speak for longer than your speech time, so if you stand up and decide, like, eh, I'm just going to give a 10 minute to NC, no one's going to listen to you. Right? So those are the only quote unquote rules of debate. Everything else in debate is a norm. Everything else in debate is a norm. What is, a, what is a norm? How is that different than a rule? Preferably someone who was not in my little elective last night, because I know that we talked about this. Yeah? Like, it's not required. It's just like people expect you to do it, but like if you don't, you're not going to like get kicked out because yeah. it's not required. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So a rule is like hard and fast. You have to follow this. If you don't follow this, you will be kicked out. So for example, if you don't wear a mask, you will be kicked out of camp. <laughs> Boom. Yes. Yes, we are serious about this. Rule. That is a rule. Norm, instead, is something that's generally expected to follow. And if you break that norm, you know, there may or may not be consequences, but it's not guaranteed. Right? So, like, a good norm is you should be taking notes on paper and have your computer put away right now because. We all know that you're going to be sitting there playing video games and not really taking notes if you have your computer out. <laughs> but if you're taking notes on paper, then you're going to get better notes. Right? But that's not a rule. Do we want to make it a rule, actually? What are you doing? <laughs> I love that. Okay, it's a, it's a rule now. Put your computers away. I changed my mind. <laughs> calls into question how we talk about things. Rhetoric calls into question how we talk about things. Right? So why do we use certain words to describe different people or different countries and different states? Right? Why do we call them illiberal democracies? Right? Those are rhetoric-based questions, rhetoric-based critiques. Or threat. Mm -hmm. Or we need to securitize. So, in classic critique fashion, remember critiques call into question all of the norms. While these are three kinds of critiques, three categories, you can't really just look at one critique and say it's going to fit into just that category. Because, you know, critiques are calling into question norms, they will call into question the norm that these are different things. Right? So a critique can't oftentimes be an epistemology argument, an ontology argument, and a rhetoric argument, or some combination of those three things. Right, so we introduce these ideas, these three kinds of critiques, to kind of help you conceptually understand how uh, these norms are being challenged and kind of how they are generally categorized. But it is really important to understand passage of the plan, right? The affirmative stands up and will say, the U.S. should propose to NATO that 
uh, there should be cycle red lines uh, backed up by Article 5, right? And the negative will say, no, that is a bad idea. That plan should not happen, right? That's what we mean by this first point here, right? The passage of the hypothetical plan, right? That action is good or bad. But it's also important to recognize that debate also happens in the room itself, right? We're all people. We're all saying things. We come to this space thinking and knowing certain things, believing certain things, right? We're not just like robots who can just turn off everything else outside, right? Debate, we all oftentimes like to think that, that debate is this like insulated space, like this vacuum, and it's not, right? So it's important to recognize that Debate is not only happening at this level of the hypothetical plan, but it is also happening in the room itself. Right? That, in fact, is maybe another norm that a critique will often call into question, right? This idea that debate is kind of a vacuum, that it's separated from other things around us, et cetera. Right? So as an argument that suggests a concept or assumption of the affirmative is problematic, a critique will oftentimes happen at both of these levels, right? Both criticizing the action of the affirmative and uh, the kind of level of the debate itself. Everyone with me so far? Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Um, I've heard of like um, running critiques on the app. What does that mean? Um, let's put a pin in that one, put it in our back pocket, we'll come back to us. Please remember to ask us that question again at the end. Because yeah. that is a great question and very important. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Totally. So a critique in general has three parts. We've got a link, we've got an impact, we've got an alternative. A link is the thing that the other side is doing that is problematic, right? So what is that norm? What is that assumption of the affirmative that you would like to call into question? That's what the link is. Right? Impact, why is that bad? Right, we always gotta impact things. Love a good impact. And then finally is the alternative, which says, here's what should happen instead. Here's what should happen instead. Yeah. So for me, that helps me think about it a lot. So it seems, so the critique is, if this does not help you, please ignore it. <laughs> But for me, it helps me to think of this as like a disadvantage, but instead of something in the hypothetical world of the plan, it's a disadvantage to the way that the app presents a certain concept. So in that way, it's very similar, right? We have a link. Um, in the case of the K that we're gonna be dealing with at this camp, it's the way that we're talking about security, the way that we're talking about defending ourselves against Russia that has an impact, so it makes us um, like bad kind of citizens in the world. And so then we're gonna offer a counter plan, basically, how we should actually address the problem that's not a hypothetical plan. Really good, smart. Other questions so far? Wonderful. I would suggest that there are three kinds of critiques. Three kinds of critiques. First kind is what's called an epistemology critique. Epistemology. Right, so epistemology is this big, fancy, ancient Greek word that basically means the study of knowledge. Right, so epistemology is defined as the study of knowledge. So an epistemology critique calls into question how we know what we know. 
So for example, how do you know that you were supposed to show up at 9 a.m. in Anthropology 303? Right? How did you come to learn that? Or how do you know that Sammy and I are super qualified experts and that you should listen to and write down every word that we say with bated breath? Very exciting. Right? How do you know that? How have you come to know that that is how you should think about things? Right? Those are questions of epistemology. To put this in debate terms, how do we know that Russia is a threat? How have we come to learn that they are going to cyber attack the United States and that that cyber attack is going to escalate to nuclear conflict? Or how do we know that to solve that problem, we should implement a plan through the US federal government? Why is that our first move in debate? Let's epistemology. Next time, ontology. Ontology. Which is another fancy ancient Greek word that suggests the study of being. The study of being. Right? So an ontology critique calls into question how do we come to be? Raise your hand if you've ever seen The Matrix. Okay, so this is something I can actually still say. The kids, the kids are not too young for this yet. We're getting there. A new one came out. A new one? That's true. A new one did come out. Reset. I haven't seen it, but I know it's a lot. That's all we need. Jeremy. That's all we need. Right? The Matrix, right? Questions of ontology. How do they know that their world is real? How do you know that you are not, right now, actually inside of a machine that's like feeding off your life energy to feed other machines? <laughs> Right? This is actually a very famous philosophical experiment. How do you know that you are not literally just a brain inside of a vat right now, and someone else is just like poking your brain to make you think that you are having all of these experiences around you? Those are questions of ontology. Yeah. So you're bringing this brain in that idea into the debate? So people in debate don't really say this anymore, thankfully, because um, it's, it's honestly kind of silly. Um, ontology critiques will tend to pop up in thinking about um, kind of prerequisites to existence. So the most common one will uh, take an approach developed in some anti-blackness literature that suggests that the state of anti-blackness is one that is ontological, it is one that is pre-discursive, it is one that explains how all reality works. So it's a, a question of racial relations. Yes. Yeah. That's the most common ontology argument in debate. There are others. Like um, ones about gender or sex, ones about sexuality. I think that all of those questions could be, could be in that category, but might also be in a different category. Yes, definitely. Yeah, usually ontology questions come into either identities or structures in debates. So then the third type of critique is a rhetoric critique. A rhetoric critique. I assume you all have heard the word rhetoric before, particularly in terms of politics. Right? I assume you've heard people say like, oh, Donald Trump's rhetoric, right? Or Joe Biden's rhetoric, right? Usually when people use that word, they mean it to say a really vacuous statement, right? They're like, this is meaningless. They're just, they're just blowing air. I would suggest that rhetoric is a bit more complicated than that. Instead, I want you all to think about rhetoric as suggesting that words, the things that we say, and how we say them have meaning that is sometimes unintentional. And this is true either because words have different meaning throughout history. Sometimes the way that we say things kind of uh, communicates ideas that are potentially unintentional. 
basically, rhetoric calls into question how we talk about things. Rhetoric calls into question how we talk about things. Right, so why do we use certain words to describe different people or... Let's keep that. Yeah. I'll ask you later. You have a lot of great questions that we are going to get back to, we promise. <laughs> no, don't apologize. They are honestly really good questions. Can you just like question like the entire like viewpoint of the West and like whether the West is act like whether NATO representing Western ideals is even good for the world? Yes, absolutely. Chris A, you are a K debater. <laughs> thriving. Yes. And to kind of get back to your question, that's basically what the critique is actually that we have for the camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Great cue. And we'll talk more about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious. Why is it spelled that way? Uh, it's a German, German word for yeah. critique. And some bougie We're pretentious. debater yeah. was like, this is a great idea. <laughs> it's one of those. If you spell it with like a C and a Q U E, everyone's gonna know what you're talking about. I don't know. We're yeah, we're pretentious, that's what I got. Yeah. But it's the German word. Other questions? Alright, Samantha. <laughs> okay, so for my portion right now, we're gonna talk a little bit just about ideas, and then we're gonna go over some of the like major vocabulary of our critique that we are reading within our camp. So the glossary is not extensive in the sense that it could be any word that you would get in the critique, but it will be helpful for the debates that you will have. So it is helpful, I think, to think about historical buildup to what this like weird kind of debate argument is. And so since ancient Greece, we're talking Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, there have been debates about truth. So philosophers, Plato, learning from Socrates, are like, there is exactly one truth, capital T truth, and our job on the earth is to find out what that is, to try to get as close as we can as possible. Remember, he's thinking of all of the um, gods, plural, in ancient Greece, and he's like, we can do different practices to get to that truth. And so for him, it's what we now know as the Socratic method. Does anybody know what the Socratic method is? Yeah, I kind of know like the like Socratic like methods and stuff, or like like lectures, or like when you have like a group discussion, or like everybody's kind of talking about it instead of just listening to one person. Okay, does anybody want to add on to that? Yeah. Um, and when you're in those type of discussions, you keep asking the why, like yes. why do you think that, or why is that true, or how can you interpret the language you're speaking in another way. So good. So I think a mix of those is absolutely correct. So uh, usually in, when in Plato's depictions of this, it's like one person asking another person a series of questions. It's like um, the dialogues. Like... It's exactly okay. the dialogues. Right. You're nailing it. So it's the method in which the dialogues happen. So it's a series of questions over and over again, trying to poke holes in your argument until eventually, Plato argues, we get to the truth. So at the same time, all these writings are happening, and Plato's is like, we need to do the Socratic method, we need to tr you know, come about truth, capital T, truth. There's another movement happening called the Sophists. Sophists, as in short for sophisticated. And so there are a bunch of teachers that come in hot and are hired by Richie Riches to educate their students or their children to become politicians, higher ups in the Greek society. Because suddenly there's a democracy, right? So people can persuade other people to get in places of power. And so the sophists are like, capital T truth, no, that's not a thing. 
there are many different kinds of truths, and we can alter that through a process of rhetorical invention. So the way we talk, the way we can persuade, determines the truth rather than we can find it eventually. So one version is we got to find it. We're going to get to it if we just try hard enough. The other one is actually the truth is pretty malleable. And it's about whatever anybody believes at one time. So critiques usually deal with the smaller truths, but sometimes the capital truths. Ontology can sometimes deal with the capital T truths. Right? How are people coming to be? How are, um, how, how do we understand things? But most of the time it's like the way that we talk about things or the way that the processes in which teach us to come to know are what determines truth and sometimes that truth is questionable. So we should spend time in the debate to, to, to talk about how we come to know those things as true. You with me so far? I knew it. You're all a bunch of smarties. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few keywords. If you have questions, shout them out at any time. All right, first one is humanism. So humanism is a system of thought that attaches prime importance to human. So in the sense of in the world, the thing that we should worry about the most are human beings. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings. So humans have the ability to make things better. They emphasize common human needs and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. So lots of smart people, people that work in philosophy now, criticize the humanism because it emphasizes the rational, autonomous self, and ignores how power influences how human beings are understood. So let me give you an example. A few years ago, when we had the climate topic in college, so we were like, climate change is really bad, we need to fix climate change, there were critiques that said, the problem with how we've been addressing climate change is that it centers human beings rather than centering the whole environment itself. So that other than the human being. And that by doing that, we can find better solutions to deal with climate. Another way to, that humanism is critiqued is that humanism usually presumes a certain kind of subject, which is just like a way of saying a certain kind of human being. And that human being, when it's written, humanism comes from like enlightenment. So that kind of human being, what do we think? What are enlightenment people talking about? What kind of person? White? Super white. What else? They're like, they're like the educated class, and they're like men, and they have money. Yeah, they have money. They are men. Yeah. They're probably religious. They're like Christian. There is, our boy Descartes is pretty religious, yes. Okay, so the rational human subject then becomes this white dude who is straight, has money, is, you know, higher up on the caste system, probably comes from like a predominant family. And so 
Critiques of humanism usually say, by presuming that that is the subject that can make decisions, we ignore the needs of a bunch of other people. And that kind of thinking that presumes one kind of rational subject leads to things like sexism, racism, heteronormativity, classism, anything else you can think of. The cent centering on the West, right, rather than local South or the East. So humanism refers to the belief that there is a certain kind of rational subject. You get a little bit. How are we feeling about that? Good so far? Any sort of sign of life? Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so now we're going to talk about power, specifically disciplinary power. The reason why I wrote Michel Foucault up there is because your critique deals with a lot of his ideas. He's a French philosopher. He looks like an egg. He looks like an egg. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I feel like that is important context. Thank you, Chris. I forgot to put that on my slide. Okay. So he has a certain theory of power. And I think once you think about it, you're like, this just makes sense. So power, he says, is coupled with knowledge. So what would that mean? What category of K would that be? Epistemology. Good. Good. So Foucault is all about thinking about how we come to know things. So he says that institutions create knowledge, and that determines how power is structured. Who has it and who doesn't. So let's think about this briefly for a moment. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, scientists argued that the size of your skull determined how smart you were. This was a branch of science known as phrenology. They further argued that black skulls, people, black people who skulls, were smaller and therefore had smaller brains than white people. I know, it is so dumb. I see your face and you're right. Okay, so this happens and because of the prominence of the people that are saying it, literal scientists, it is determined as true. It's very famous. Lots of people write about it. It's published in newspapers as a common idea of the time. Yeah. Is this kind of like the collapsing of Darwinism for social Darwinism? I think. Okay. Yeah, social Darwinism is happening at this time. Okay, so, so you can keep that same idea in mind for this. So because of who said it, what institutions were saying it, places like Harvard University, right? People were like, that has to be true. The brightest minds of our time are saying this, so it's true. So that determines what kind of actions people can take. It determines how we treat each other. So power, in this instance, is not static, like it's not a thing that Either you have it or you don't, and that's the rest of your life. Rather, it's a complicated relationship between people that is determined by what kind of things we come to know. Yeah. So, in the sense that power can be changed by institutions, it's productive. What would that mean? Does anybody kind of know? Yeah. Like, if, like why power is productive? Yeah. Like if certain institutions are going to favor certain people, kind of like the basic white men we were talking about, like last 
slide or whatever, mm -hmm. like the institutions can make power productive by like not necessarily forcing it, because I guess it would already have happened, but like or like just making it so that it only benefits certain people to make it what they want. Okay, so you're saying like the way that power is used. Yeah. Good. The institutions can use it to their benefit. Right. The other way is that I want to kind of emphasize is that it's it's produced in the sense that it's not natural. It's produced by the kinds of knowledge we introduce. <coughs> so certain people can produce it, other people cannot. For instance, in this classroom, Nick and you all know that Nick and I, because we are standing at the front and we're put on a schedule, right, are giving you knowledge, which gives us power because you understand those norms. Okay. So this is his larger, so if we're thinking about like this is the umbrella part, where this is how Michel Foucault, within your critique, perceives of power largely. This is a kind of power that was talked about within your critique. Disciplinary power. So that is a separate term. Disciplinary power. Which is a particular type of power which, which subjects exercise over their own person, such as the application of rules of conduct and appropriate behavior. So disciplinary power is like what like your inner thinking, what's going on in your head. For example, you know that when I'm speaking at the front of the classroom, you're not allowed to like burst out in song. Right? You know that if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand. That's a form of disciplinary power that you control your own actions through the kind of knowledge that you've been taught over time. So do we see how those things connect? People in charge of institutions get to determine knowledge, which then teaches other kinds of folks how to control themselves within certain spaces and interactions with certain kinds. When you are pulled over for driving too fast, you know that you need to sit in your car and roll down your window, and you need to say certain kinds of things, so sorry officer, I didn't know, right? All those things are also disciplinary power. Okay, how are we feeling about that? Thumbs up? Dope. Next term is master narrative, which is a trans-historical narrative that is deeply embedded in a particular culture. What do I mean when I say trans-historical? Yeah, it goes throughout different periods of time, so it's common throughout all of time. Or the yeah, time. it's not. You're totally. You nailed it. It's not embedded within a certain type of a certain place in history. So it's like, it kind of reaches the level of like myth, almost. But it's been embedded in our culture for so long that suddenly we're like, yeah, this must be true. It's just presumed to be true because of how long it's been there. So that's what we mean by deeply embedded. It's like we keep telling ourselves something over and over and over again until suddenly it feels true. So what would be an example of the American culture? Yeah. Um, sort of like manifest destiny and the fact that we actually can like live on this land and like sometimes I think we forget that people lived here before like us. Yeah. Manifest destiny is a great example. Chris is here for the day. Um, yeah, yeah. What else? Um, I think Eurocentrism is also a master, uh, master narrative. Yes, Eurocentrism, certainly coming from enlightenment, right? The invention of humanism is a huge part of what makes that happen. Yeah. Um, like, that's a big thing. Like, the U.S. philosophy that we have to have a huge military and impose it over and over else the world's going to collapse. 
Right. So like, um, like the sort of myth of like the United States needs to be the leader of the world, and the way that we do that is through militarism. Good. Did you have one too? Oh, uh, I was going to say American patriotism, and like it makes me think of like uh, July Fourth. Like, why do we celebrate the way we do? Why do we even think of doing that in the first place? Yeah, like the ways that we think about uh, the American Revolution, for example, are very transhistorical in the sense that they're not really built on like factual evidence of the time. Because it's like imbued, like endowed with all these other kinds of beliefs. Yeah. Uh, capitalism based on like uh, history of the United States trying to make money. Uh, yeah, and there's a cap page for that. Yeah, so like um, thinking about capitalism as the only way that we can do economics fairly, right? We hear people say that all the time. Like, I'm still a capitalist, but also maybe. Everyone should have health care. And then everyone has a freak out. Totally. Yeah? Um, this one's relevant to, this one's about China, that throughout history, like, the Chinese called themselves the Middle Kingdom, because they thought that they were, like, the only country that existed in the planet. And so they had this narrative, like, they were in the center of the world. Um, and so, like, throughout history, they think that's, like, going back like, in the medieval times, that's how they thought of themselves, that they were in the middle of the world. Now, now I'm learning stuff. I had no idea. But that would be particular to their culture, right? This is a different culture. Yeah. The idea of like the first, second, and third world countries, which I guess is also like rooted in the US. Yeah, the idea of first, second, and third world countries, totally, where like, like what does it even mean to be developed, right? All of those things come with assumptions and things that we learn over time. It's good. Anything else you want to add? These are great examples. Um, just the idea of East and West, like what? How do we start? What part of the world is east? What part of the world is west? How do we even come to that in the first place? I thought the world was round. It doesn't make any sense. But we can think of that, right? Because it's based on where the United States is. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. This is kind of building off that. Because, like, I saw this in like, a Western episode. It was like the idea of like northern countries or like, countries above the equator or like, like inherently better, kind of like that. So it was like, why don't we just like flip over maps? Like, why don't we just turn them upside down and teach kids like that? And then maybe we'll see how like the country is like, the new north, like the south, like they'll start to become like more of like not like like developed, but like they'll have like the culture that like, northern countries do now because like people will see them as like because they're higher up mm -hmm. on the map, like people associate that with like they are literally higher up, like they're more yeah, like, I don't more better, but like that and so they're like, well why don't we just change it? Like why don't we just flip over the map? And, like why don't we just like mirror the map to the east and the west? Yeah, so like um, the ways that maps are drawn is a part of all of the sort of myths that we've already talked about. Really good. Yeah. Uh, imperialism in countries only has the other side of the world from the moment and like how that stuff is Yeah, like the ways that they were like, no, 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 no. We came there and we said it. So it's ours now. Totally. But then it seems natural over time because the way that we tell history. Yeah. Uh, a lot of places in the South, they still have, like, they still call it the Civil War, but the states of Russia. Um, as uh, University of Georgia current graduate students can confirm it is the War of Northern Aggression, and we will refer to it as such. Okay, these are great examples. You want one more, Chris? Um, just democracy, like, or our constitution and how we place so much importance on it, but, like, at the time that it was written, we also agreed that, like, slaves were three-fifths of a prison. Right, so like there are constitutional um, judges that are like, if it's not written in the Constitution, it's not true, but they also disavow a lot of what was written in the Constitution. Really good. Okay, so transhistorical narratives, long-time beliefs that we think are embedded in history, but also are usually imbued with certain values and ideas. Good. All right, now we're going to do a little bit of rough one. Hang in there with me, kids. <laughs> we're talking about governmentality. All right, so governmentality is combining the words government and rationality. What is a rationality? Yeah? Uh, I guess something you use to make decisions. Something you use to make decisions? Okay, good. What can we add to that? Yeah, it's like 
like kind of like sanity is like if you're making rational decisions if you are a rational person like you're not just going to kind of decide I guess like depending on the topic you're not going to be like well then let's new brushes just for fun like that is not rational decisions that you're not rational but they're like if you're like well let's find a more peaceful solution or let's make a NATO that would be a rational solution yeah so rationality I think of a, as akin to like logic but it is, um, but what kind of this kind of critique brings into light is the fact that rationality isn't like an inherent thing that your brain does, but rather a set of learned rules that you develop over time. So this term brings into the fact that the way that we are governed teaches us to interact in very particular ways or to reason within very particular ways. So, rationality as a form of thinking suggests that before people or things can be controlled or managed, they must first be defined. What kind of government documents do you fill out that define you? Yeah. Your birth certificate. Your birth certificate. What kind of information does your birth certificate have? I don't know why I would mess that up. Your parents. Your parents, your gender, right? All that stuff is assigned on a birth certificate, helps the government figure out what kind of person you are. Yeah. The U.S. Census. The Census. Huge. What kind of information is on the Census? Uh, income, amount of children, race especially, gender. Where you live, right? Locality. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Um, like driver's license or passport forms or like things that would like give you like your physical identification of like this is like my license or whatever and it says all of these things about me or who the government thinks that I am. Right. So whether or not you're a veteran, um, if you're an organ donor, uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Selective service. Yeah, totally. So all of these things that are kind of like mundane everyday activities are actually ways that the government can manage and administrate certain groups of people. Sorry, there's a question over here. Signature. So, for example, like we can think about the military draft. If you sign that you are man on the military draft, that helped the government classify who could be drafted and who could not. Right. In the same way that levels of income determine whether or not you qualify for certain programs, or your age determines if you get social security. So it's a way that the government can classify you and decide how you should interact with that government, what kind of things you should and should not get. And it's a willing thing. We do it automatically, right? Like, I did not think twice about when I filled out a sheet for my government ID so that I could drive. Or FAFSA, Jeez. Or FAFSA, right. So I could get student loans. That's a good one. Okay. I swear we're getting to the end of it. Yes. And I'll send this out, so if you're having a moment, don't worry. All right, we good? Yeah. Um, this, does this, this definitely doesn't link to all governments, like for example, North Korea, um, they basically, I feel like North Korea is more dis disciplinary power, or I think more of like uh, power where the government is not willing to be governed. So, um, so it doesn't mean that they don't have a governmentality, it just, it just assesses a different context. So in this case, for our critique, we're going to critique the American form of governmentality, but that form of governmentality would do other things. But it doesn't negotiate 
So these things kind of overlap too. Like how we discipline ourselves and how we act in public has a lot to do with the rationality of how we're governed. So I think you're totally right. If we think about like the umbrella of power knowledge, we have disciplinary power and governmentality, but those things also intersect. So I think you're nailing it. But it's just different. It's a different set of rules. Good. That was a really good question. Okay, anything else? Now let's talk about paradigm shift. So you'll hear this word a lot. Usually it's a part of the alternative. Which is what? What's alternative? Right, it's like a fancy K version of a counterplay. So it's the alternative to the affirmative. So what we should do instead. Good job. So paradigm shift is a fundamental change in approach or underlying assumptions. What should we vote on in the debate? The K would say it's not if the plan is going to stop nuclear war. How should we solve problems? It's not going to be the United States should pass policies. Can I also add that a paradigm shift also works in thinking within the certain sets of things that we have. So an alternative could theoretically say, yeah, maybe we should pass policies, but the way that we decide how to pass policies should be entirely different. Yeah. So we would have like a totally different sense of self, maybe. The governmentality would have to change. Yeah, thanks, Ben. All right, we feeling good about this one? This one you've got. I think it's the last one, which is abolition, which is a word I'm sure you know, but just in case, is the action or act of abolishing a system practice or institution. So the abolition movement in the United States in the 19th century was what? Slavery. Abolishing and slavery. Good. Smart, smart. So getting rid of the institution of slavery, which would be, I think, all of these things, a system, practice, and institution. But abolition will be the alternative. So hang in there. All right, feeling good about this one? Yes. Yes? So the things like racism and things like institutionalized and like systemic, how would you like abolish that system if the society is basically built on it? Like how is that something like that's feasible in a debate where like the plan is kind of like, you can put in place but like abolishing racism really is not? Yeah, so this is a great question. And one that many debates tackle. Usually they'll say something like, we need to align ourselves with the politics of abolition. Maybe abolition doesn't happen today. But if we continuously talk about aligning ourselves with such a task, we could eventually get there. So most of the time people are like, obviously we can't just like undo that today. It's like the rum built in the day kind of thing. But we could eventually do it if we align ourselves right. Yeah. I mean, isn't there already like a movement of like prison abolition? Yes, there is, right? So prison abolition would be what? An institution, right? So just that in our society, so that could be as easy as like changing a law, right? Uh, racism in itself is more of an idea and a practice, so that's a little harder, but prison abolition it's just like, let's just put a different system in place. It's not that easy. But it's a little easier than the ideological one. Good. Uh, just kidding, there's one more. Militarization. Is this the last one? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Which is the processes through which military influence and priorities are extended to civilian life. What's a civilian? Everyone, that's someone who's not in the military. Good. So we mere mortals, <laughs> not in the military, civilians. But 
militarization says that suddenly civilians are now influenced by military actions or identifying with the military. What would be one example? Can somebody think of one? Yeah. Nazi Germany? Yeah, Nazi Germany I think is that all of the civilians suddenly were like, yeah, we're on board, we're part of the military now, we're going to identify with them. I think that's good. Yeah? I mean, I get a bunch of like, military ads that like, you have to like, do each like, third year fight group. Um, so. so that's like recruitment, so kind of, but a little, um, but that's like also just like literal military, right? Trying to get you to join. Yeah? The concept of total war and mobilizing your civilian population to assist you when you're trying to fight a war? Yeah, like support your troops, right? Like all that kind of stuff, totally. Yeah? This may be a little bit like general or far out, but like I think the overall sense of patriotism could be considered this because like when you think of like patriotism, like especially in America, it's not like, oh, we're a good country. It's like our military business. Our military made the country to like, like everything about the country is like we owe it to the military, like let's go. like. America, like all of that, is like it, they always find a way to like relate it back to like the military made us free, the military like, made us America. Yeah, so like an identification as an American as being supportive of the military. If you're a good American, then you are you support the troops, right? Good. Okay, thank you much for remembering this, but I'm pretty sure Israel has a requirement of adult citizens to serve in the military. Yeah, but they so Are you? That doesn't quite like do the blurring of the lines, but a little bit, right? Because then every civilian is part of the military. So I guess that is. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like using private companies to help the military building weapons and it's a lot of Yeah, so private companies suddenly becoming part of the military through the ways that they interact, with developing certain kinds of technology or other things. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so the ways that civilians participate in colonization, good, yeah. Um, I'm not the most informed, but like during the Reagan administration, the uh, military started cooperating with like police departments, which meant that like military technology began being used on like uh, everyday populations, and also how that extends to like surveillance and how was it Edward Snowden and how he like whistle blew like the NSA, like the government was like surveying people and how that works in our everyday lives? Yes, yeah. So that was going to be my example: the way in which police officers now use military technology on civilians is one other way of militarization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of like going off of that, how uh, you're like not supposed to attack civilians, right? But then in the U.S., we now treat, because the police being militarized, we treat the regular citizens, like protesters, as enemy combatants. We use the same technology against them. Yeah, so that becomes, like, suddenly, like, priorities in the ways we think about war, right? All right, got to move past this, but keep those thoughts. If there are questions, I want to hear them. Okay. Nicholas Lutz is going to tell us how to read Go For K. Just beat him, duh. Duh. Uh, actually, honestly, that is the first thing on here for a reason, which is that uh, when reading the critique, I think it is a very common belief and or assumption that it's just like so radically different. It's nothing like anything you've seen before. And like, yeah, sometimes that's true, but critiques really are not all that different from other arguments that you've got in debate. Like, yes, they call into question a lot of the norms and the assumptions, that we believe, but like, you can just win the critique by doing line by line, doing impact calculus slash comparison, saying that your impact outweighs the affirmative, saying that your alternative solves your impact, winning that the app doesn't solve their own impact. And I think that we oftentimes forget this, right? We get too wrapped up in our, our you know, we got to make the world so different kind of brains that we forget that the critique is it's just another argument in debate. So this is purposefully the very first thing up here. Just beat them. 
do your line by line, do impact calculus and comparison, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see my message, by the way? Mm -hmm. Cool. Second thing that I want you all to keep in mind is that you should be diversifying your link arguments. Diversifying your link arguments. The worst critiques are those that will only criticize one thing. Right? So if you stand up and are just like, yep, we're criticizing fiat this to be, you can win. It does happen quite frequently. But to make your critique even better, you should add in criticisms of other assumptions as well. Right? Not just fiat, but also securitization, but also militarism, but also governmentality, et cetera, et cetera. Diversifying your links will give you extra lines of offense and extra ways of responding to and dealing with the affirmative. Okay, so you should diversify your links. But you need to make sure they are ideologically and epistemologically compatible. What I mean by that is if you want to forward a single theory about how the world works, right? So if you're reading an ontology critique, for example, that says some certain structure or some certain identity or some certain violence explains how everything works, you can't then say, here's a different kind of violence structure, etc., that also explains how everything works. That is incompatible. That doesn't make any sense. Right? So you can't literally just like pull anything out of any random K back file ever and just be like, cool, I got it, we've got a critique now. You need to think about how these things work together. Which we're going to get a little bit more into when we talk more about the alternative. But I do want to really, really say here, like diversify your links. Do you have a question? Cool. So you should just beat them. And you should diversify your links. Is easy. To win, maybe, just make sure you have to win every single like part of it. Have to win an and alternative. Um, so you have to win a link and an impact. You probably have to win your alternative, but that is not always one hundred percent true. Okay. I, I just like last year I tapped the other day. Okay. And I mean the alternative is pretty bad. Um, and so we we won a lot. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a little bit more about different ways to think about going for the critique that will help you deal with those things. Because, again, remember, the critique is going to call into question all of these norms, and sometimes it will call into question the norm of needing to have an alternative. Brandon? You say diversify your links. Do you mean, like, use different types of ontology and rhetoric links, or use all the same types, but then different... Different issues with each one. Closer to the first one, but also kind of both. Okay. Basically, you should call the question multiple assumptions of the affirmative. Okay, I'm trying to think of an example. So, like, if Nick is reading the cyber app, I might call into question the use of the USFG as an actor that could solve that problem. I might call into question the ways that Nick is talking about Russia as another link that is problematic, and the use of the kind of mechanisms that he's hoping. So maybe that NATO is a good cooperative um, actor, for example. Or that the West could resolve the problem at all. So those would be three different links, but that gives me choices as the debate goes on. All right, you should explain your alternative. You should explain your alternative. Give us a little story, just a little one. And when I say explain your alternative, obviously I certainly mean like, tell us what it means to vote negative for abolition, which is what the alternative on our camp packet critique is. But I also mean even more than that, you should explain how it solves both your own impacts and the affirmative. 
How does it solve your own impacts and the affirmative, right? Earlier, when someone asked about whether the alternative is like a counter plan or not, in some ways, you should think of the alternative like a counter plan insofar as it should solve the app. Your alternative should solve the app. Okay, it should suggest that we no longer need to worry about these impacts that the affirmative is talking about. So, for example, with our alternative, it says abolish NATO, right? It obviously solves the impacts to the critique insofar as we are no longer kind of securitizing NATO, we're no longer kind of securitizing Russia. I would suggest you'd want to say that if we get rid of NATO, it also solves the app because now Russia has no incentive to cyber attack the United States, right? It solves the reasons why Russia might have wanted to uh, be concerned about cyber in the first place. Yeah, you can see. So, like, I know with, like, chaos, they don't necessarily need to be topical. Would this apply for just, like, a regular critique? Um, critiques, so any argument by the negative does not need to be topical. It is only the affirmative. The, the only norm uh, is on the affirmative for being topical. So, please explain your alternative, please explain how it solves your own impacts and the affirmative's impact. And I think the and the affirmative's impact is a thing that oftentimes gets lost in the sauce. Another way that you can read and go for a critique, which starts to get kind of toward diseases question about, I don't know, maybe my alternative's not very good, is by positing a different role of the ballot or decision-making model or ethical calculus. This is you know, calling into question the norm in debate of how the judge should decide the debate, right? Normally, when we decide debates as judges, we are voting for who we think has either, you know, properly defended their affirmative, presented an impact, and suggested a solution, or if the negative has said, no, that's not really an impact, that's not a very good solution, right? A different role of the ballot, decision-making model, ethical calculus, calls into question that norm and suggests that there should instead be a different norm or different way of deciding how debate works. Yeah, Sarah. Yes. So, um, like, back to what um, I asked for about, like, is it for that reason? Mm -hmm. um, is it Sammy? Yeah, she said that it, it would take a long time. So your um, critique or all your alternatives in your critique solved the app, but it would take, like, a long time. Like, is that still viable? Can you still use that? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Because remember, you're also bringing into question the norm of fiat. So it's not like the plan is done, everything's solved, right? You're saying the way that we are participating right now also perpetuates a kind of knowledge, thus a power structure. So if you're voting for the alternative, we'll create like better human beings that can solve the future, or we are endorsing a movement rather than the USFG that would solve that thing better. So you'd be winning like probability. Mm -hmm. So the kind of most common different decision making model or ethical calculus suggests that utilitarianism or util for short is a bad thing. Who wants to tell me what utilitarianism is? Ted. Utilitarianism is a political philosophy that says like, whatever has the best outcome is the thing that we should go for uh, in most circumstances. Kind of. Right, so all, we may call into question the idea that we should care about outcomes, but generally speaking, all roles of the ballot are going to care about outcomes. Right, so we've got to be a, a little bit more. Um, it says that you should try to do, like, the most good for the most people, so if the app impact is, like, extinction or nuclear war, you'd say that's going to hurt the most people, mm -hmm. and you should vote to avoid that. Exactly. So utilitarianism is just as the belief that we should prioritize the most amount of good for the greatest number of people. Notice how I said the word people. This brings us back into that question of humanism that Sammy was talking about beforehand. People will criticize utilitarianism and suggest that it oftentimes forgets certain peoples, or it forgets certain beings, right? The greatest amount of good for the greatest number of beings would suggest, you know, you should save two people and allow your mother to die 
in exchange, because that's the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. Right? This is usually how we determine debates. Right? Because it's assumed that extinction or you know global mass death is the worst thing that could happen. Right? That's the, the most harm to the most people. Right? So inversely, utilitarianism, got to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people, stop extinction. Right? I would say the most common different kind of ethical calculus is to say, reject that approach to doing impact work. And instead have something else. Prioritize the people who are forgotten, prioritize not people, prioritize the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other ones. People will have call and ask kind of method or ethic-based questions. Right? So maybe representations are more important. Maybe the way that we talk about certain things or present those certain ideas should be the thing that we are most concerned about. Right? Debate doesn't leave the room. The only thing that matters from debate is what we learn from it. Are we becoming better people after we debate? Right? So maybe it shouldn't be about body counts. Maybe it shouldn't be about whether a policy is a good idea in the abstract, but it should be about how we've come to know that that policy is a good idea. Okay, so this is a very common strategy that people will do, and oftentimes allows you to sidestep the alternative question that Aziz was asking about. Now, I would add, by the way, that, so my biggest pet peeve as a judge, when judging the critique, is when someone stands up and says, you know, the role of the ballot is such and such, and then moves on immediately. That's not an argument. What is an argument? A claim, and a warrant, and reasoning. If you just say the role of the ballot is such and such and move on, you have not introduced an argument. The role of the ballot is to vote negative. Right, like the role of the ballot, <laughs> the role of the ballot is to vote for Sammy because she's awesome and just got her PhD. Done. That's more of an argument than the role of the ballot is to vote negative. Because at least that has a warrant, it doesn't really have reasoning, but it's closer. Right, so you have to do the work to explain why you know, your thing that you're suggesting comes first. In other words, you have to do impact calculus in comparison. This different role of the ballot decision-making model ethical calculus is really just a fancy K way of saying, do impact calculus in comparison, but do it by calling into question certain norms. Peter. So, should you do impact calculus in the alt debate then, or in the impact debate? Both. Both. It's a different level of impact calculus, right? So the, the thing before that I had said about, like, just beat them, duh, it's like, presupposes, you know, is the affirmative preventing extinction, does the alternative have an, or does the critique have an extinction impact, right? Does your extinction impact, does it outweigh the affirmative extinction impact? So thinking about, like, the two levels of debate. Mm -hmm. So, like, on one level, does abolition solve the impact, or solve the impact of the app? On the other level, are we better human people after the debate? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's one complain about that a little more. No, I don't need to about that anymore. Impact work, also very useful, and this is a little bit different as well than just saying, you know, our chaos always the case. You should forward the argument that your critique acts as a root cause of an impact. What is a root cause? Parker. Like the underlying, like, I guess, institutional or structural, like, explanation for an impact, or, I don't know, I'm kind of getting very familiar with you. Like, the root cause, for, like, why? Yeah, exactly. So a root cause is the kind of underlying primary structural reason that something is going to happen. Right? So the militarization critique would suggest that the root cause 
of US-Russia conflict is US militarism. Right? The capitalism critique says that the root cause of environmental devastation is capitalism. If you win the root cause, then you do two things. One, you prove basically try or die for the alternative. Right? If we don't resolve this problem, then the impact is just going to keep happening in the future. Two, it proves that the act can't solve its own impact. You might also think of the root cause as some of that, in our case, the uh, master narrative stuff. Mm -hmm. So we believe this thing over a long period of time. That's the root cause of why we do actions in the way that we do. And so we need to get rid of that master narrative in order to solve the impact. Um, uh, if you win the root cause, you also have to, uh, then you also have to say, like, the stuff happening is bad, and then say, like, try to die Uh, yes. To win a root cause argument presupposes that you agree that the affirmative's impact is a bad thing. Yeah. That's actually, yeah, it's a great question, because it, it brings us back to the point before about wanting your links to be ideologically and epistemologically in line with each other. Do you have a question? Yeah, it's not like later, but are there like good poems to read against the critique? We're going to get back to that later. Okay. Put a pin in it. There are so many. So many. The other kind of thing to think about with impact work is this idea of error replication or serial policy failure, which is kind of the flip side of the root cause argument, suggesting that as long as we are within this certain paradigm or this certain approach to the world, we're going to keep making bad policies. And those bad policies are going to keep creating the problem. Right? We're just kind of pushing it off into the future. Right? So the paradigm of militarization means that we're going to keep intervening in different countries and we're going to keep creating problems. Right, so the Gulf War in the 1990s, we intervened in uh, various places throughout the Middle East slash Persian Gulf. We destabilized some communities and then we leave. In response, a bunch of uh, Certain people, certain organizations kind of pop up who are like pretty anti-American. 9-11. Response to 9-11, intervene in the same places. Got to go get the terrorists, you know, got to stop them. And 20 years later, we're still, well, I guess we're starting to pull out maybe, but we're still mostly there. Same cycle keeps repeating itself. Right? The policies that occur because of militarization intervene, kill them all, leave. More people are like, this is not okay. We are very unhappy with this. Keeps happening. That's this idea of error replication and serial policy failure. Aziz. Um, could you say, like, retaliation is a form of error replication? Retaliation occurs because of error replication. Okay, next thing we've got on here is a floating pick, which is, I will first say, absolutely cheating and not the most strategic move, but it is a thing that can happen and you can theoretically win a debate on it. A uh, floating pick is when the alternative does the act minus the thing that you think is bad. So, Against our affirmative, the mil if you were to read a floating pick with the militarization critique, you, were to, you would be to say, you know, we will have the U.S. propose to NATO uh, this cyber red line, uh, but we will do it without securitizing NATO and Russia. Um, the problem with this is, A, it's absolutely cheating. You theory arguments, I think, are very persuasive against the floating pick. B, it doesn't make any sense at all. Because, as it turns out, 
policies and the justifications for those policies are intertwined, right? The policy that actually happens, happens because of why we think that policy is going to happen. Which means like quite literally, you, you, you literally could not do that. But it is a debate thing, it has won debates. It can theoretically win you debates in the future. Got it. Um, are word picks like just as theoretically dubious as the example that you just mentioned? Yes and no. So a word pick out of a word in a plan text that has a both functional and textual um, justification for that pick I think is pretty reasonable. But a word pick that's like, hey, an un underlying portion of your card said this word and we don't like that word, that's probably not okay. Chris? Wait, can you like restate sort of the idea of a floating? Yeah, so the idea of a floating pick says, let's do all of the affirmative except for this thing that we're criticizing. Right, so let's do your affirmative except we're going to make it good. It is very dubious insofar as it both does not make sense and is definitely not theoretically legitimate. But it is a, what we oftentimes call a K-trick, which as the word trick implies, you know, something that you can kind of like hide in your arguments and if the affirmative drops it, they drop it, I don't know. Um, Eleanor, right? Yeah. Um, what, do, what, what does the floating part mean and are there like fixes out that are like not floating? So the floating part is just a fancy way of saying there's not a text for your alternative that says let's do the affirmative minus this thing. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's floating, it's like dubious and like weird and all over the place and that's kind of what it means. Um, people have read critiques that are, or picks that are not floating. It does happen sometimes. Um, I uh, would also be a little bit skeptical of this generally. Yeah. In what situation would you like theoretically choose to read a floating pick? Um, so I will, so the one time that I ever read a floating pick was when I knew I was losing this debate hardcore and I was like, well maybe they'll drop it and like maybe I can trick someone into voting for me. It did not work. Um, <laughs> the only time I think that it's worthwhile to have a floating pick is if you want to just like kind of hide it in your block and it, like in the block and hope that the app drops it. I don't really think it's worthwhile that much though. So. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, back to Johnny's question about word picks. Yeah. Okay, what if it's like a word that's not in the plan text, but it's like used a lot in like like card tags and like text cards and the legacy? So I personally think that competition for critiques and counter plans is determined based off of the plan text. Not everyone agrees with me. So there are arguments to be made that that is legitimate. It's a debate to be had. And that could be a link. Link. So, like, for example, um, there are, like, teams who um, read, like, a K that does, deals with gender, and somebody has a bunch of cards that say, we need to save our men, over and over and over again, men fighting our wars, blah, blah, blah. They might say, that is a link to our K that's talking about the invisibility of women from military work. I'm just making this up. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So it wouldn't be a word pick necessarily, but it would be a link. Right, like rhetoric arguments. You, you can make rhetoric arguments without picking on it. I want you to make your uh, critique as specific to the affirmative as you possibly can. The more generic that your critique is, the easier it is for the affirmative to beat it. Right? Generally speaking, the least persuasive critiques are those that just stand up and say, but you use the USFG, and the USFG is bad, therefore vote negative. Those debates, those, those cases do win debates sometimes, but the more generic your critique is, the easier it is for the affirmative to stand up and be like, yeah, but the state's done some good things sometimes. So maybe permutation, or maybe you're all as bad. So you want to incorporate these kinds of things into some of your link work, but you don't want it to be the crux of your critique. You want your critique to be as specific to the affirmative as you possibly can. In other words, I would strongly recommend that your critique operates on both levels of debate that we've talked about. Not just the, 
in room kind of thing, but also the action of the affirmative. You want to say that that action is a bad thing. That, by the way, is also how you get people to vote for you who are like, eh, I don't know about this critique thing, I don't really like those. That's how you convince them to vote for you. Because then it's just a DA. Because then it's just a DA. We love DAs. So good. Right? So don't just say state bad, fiat bad. Right? Against this affirmative, say, like, your alternative should say, we should not uh, propose to NATO a cyber red line and putting it in Article 5. Right? Talk about the action of the act. Next thing here, your overviews are bad. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Your overviews are bad. I understand the thesis of the militarism critique. I understand the thesis of the capitalism critique. You do not need to stand up and ramble about that for seven minutes in your 2NC. Instead, you need to do line by line. You need to put your arguments against the affirmative's arguments and make them specific to what the affirmative is saying. Because that is how, in all forms of debate, you get good. <laughs> Again, the, just kind of the big thing you can take away from this slide, and hopefully a big thing that you take away from just us talking about the critique generally, is you want to be specific. You want to be specific. It is my worst nightmare when a debater is like, you'll need a whole new sheet for the oh, overview. I'm like, absolutely, I will not. <laughs> I'm like, I will not flow you. That will not be you. That will be you. You are very talented debater. So, like, the affirmative is going to stand up and posit there is no link or there is no impact to the critique. You should answer those things on the line by line and explain your link or your impact or your alternative in those places. Because it forces you to be specific and make what you're saying about what they're saying. So just nix your overview. If you think you need an overview, you're wrong. You don't. Put it on the line by line. Last thing here is that you should be reasonable. You should be reasonable. Um, oftentimes in debate, we feel like we need to run to say the radical opposite of what the other team is saying. Which, like, you know, we obviously need to have competition. We want to have clash. You should disagree with the affirmative. But you don't have to disagree with, you know, literally everything and do so in such a way that you say the radical opposite of what that other team is saying. So, like, I have judged, I have judged a critique where the neg basically became anti-vaxxers, right? Like the app was like, vaccines are good. The neg was like, nope, no vaccines, always bad. I was like, that's, I don't know about this one. I don't know if we really want to say no vaccine. Though. Right, so like, obviously, competition with the app, you want to disagree with them, right? But you want to make sure you're not saying things that are really, really just wrong or offensive which I do worry sometimes we do. So basically, be specific, be reasonable, do line by line, all the things that you all already know. You should package each of your arguments as a link, impact, and alternative explanation. This is also part of why the overview doesn't really make any sense, because you want to kind of put each of these pieces together as the debate goes on. Right? Another thing that the critique should, I think, call into question is the di difference between a link impact and an alternative. Right? So you're, when you, oh god, it's, it's one of the other worst things when the neg stands up and is like, I'm going to do all of my link to work, link work here. And are just like, here's this link, here's this other link, here's this other link. But they don't explain why those links matter. You have to impact your links. You have to tell me why your links matter. So, for example, the 2AC against the militarism critique stands up and says utilitarianism is good. You should not respond by saying that's another link because utilitarianism is militaristic and then move on. Instead, you should say utilitarianism is another link to the critique 
because the very foundation of militarism is this assumption that we can push black and brown bodies to the background in favor of addressing larger impacts, so that's our link argument, that consistently means we forget about the lives who are actually affected by U.S. interventions, that's an impact argument, Voted negative shifts our decision-making calculus, or for a different paradigm, away from basic impacts to prioritizing smaller real violences as they occur now. That's an alternative explanation. That is so much more persuasive than you just standing up and being like, we have six links. Link one is utilitarianism, that's the foundation of militarism. Link two is fiat, that means we are militarists as well. Link three is the USFG. Like, you've got to package these arguments together. And in order to package those arguments together, you've got to be able to line that up. Yes, right here. Um, how many links are you like going to have in a K debate? It's really up to you. Um, I would suggest having more than one. Mm -hmm. I would suggest probably at least three or four, but it's yeah. really up to you. How many are there for like the packet argument, or how many could there be? I don't know. More than one for sure. Yeah, yeah. there's a whole section. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Parker. Ooh, that's a tougher question, and how many links you should go for in the 2 and R, I think, depends on what you're winning, what you want to use those links for, and how you are impacting those links out. Right, so like you might use, uh, uh, in response to, you, like, if the app, you know, doesn't extend utilitarianism in the 1AR, you might not go for the utilitarianism. Right, but if they do extend util, it might make sense for you to have that argument. So it kind of it depends, really. Okay, that's the end of this section. Someone asked me a question about how to read or go for it for people. Yes. Yes, you should introduce the critique in the one NC. It would just be one of your off-case positions. Mm -hmm. um, I saw in that uh, explanation of the link that you put in the impact, impact kind of into the link explanation. Mm -hmm. So when you switch from the link debate to the impact debate, do you just like push harder on the impact or explain the impact more in depth? Or like if you prefer the link and the impact? How do you explain the impact separately? Or so, do you want to do that? I generally think that you should not be explaining the impact separately. You should be explaining your impact particular to each of your link arguments. There are exceptions to this. So, like on the capitalism critique, for example, you know, that one is almost entirely going to be about just the action of the affirmative and not about what's happening in this debate. So it, it becomes a disad, basically, in which case it does kind of make sense maybe to separate these things. But like the militarization critique, which does call into question how we talk about impact. So it brings us into the world of what's happening in the debate, what's happening in this space itself. I think it makes more sense to package your link and your impact and your all arguments together. So instead of thinking conceptually, I have a link portion, I have an impact portion, I have an alternative portion, you should think, okay, the 2AC has said seven responses. I will have a link, impact, and all explanation to answer all of those. Right, so it's a, it's a lot more modular, I guess. Yeah, um, also, what is your name? I'm sorry. Oh, Emerson. Emerson. <laughs> yeah, um, I know that like for topicality arguments, those are a priori. A, is uh, the critique a priori? And then B, how do you kick the critique, or do you need to? Um, so the critique, I don't know if a priori is the right word necessarily to describe it, but some, it, but you can make yeah. the argument that it is a prior question, which okay. is actually literally what a priori translates to, but you can make the argument that it is a, a more, or the, the thing you decide before deciding the action of the affirmative, that is okay. something that a critique can forward. Yeah. It is not something that a critique has to forward. Okay. Um, and then your question of like, how do you pick what critique to read? Mm. Yeah. I think it depends on your interests and the topic um, the best K debaters will read a lot of the things that they are actually interested in. So, like, part of why Sandy gave this definition section is because she's read all of Foucault like a billion times, and I've only read some of Foucault, and I do not know it anywhere near as much as her. <laughs> right? So, like, she's way more qualified to talk about that kind of stuff than me. Yeah. Same basic idea with how the critique works in the debate. I just want to thank you, Lance. Yeah.
Yeah, we want links. We love links. <laughs> links are so good. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Question, Aaron, or are you just scratching? Possible to beat, but we will say differently. Okay, no matter what, if you are affirmative against the K, you must win. The case outweighs, unless you're going for some dumb theory argument, but we're ignoring that. The case outweighs. What does it mean to say that the case outweighs? Yeah. Sure, there's a fundamental problem, but we still stop like a nuclear impact. Right. So, like, okay, you're saying that util is bad, but also usually the first people to die in war are poorer, disadvantaged people. So util is actually not that bad of a calculus in that case. It's not going to be the richy riches and their nuclear bomb shelters that are going to die, right? Case outweighs. So that's the first thing. Yeah? Um, how would you win case outweighs if they say that their critique axis is the root cause? You so can. Doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> the first answer is it doesn't. And just like realism arguments, I think, are pretty good here. So, like, there is not a world in which we do not have global power. If the United States stopped being the hegemon, for example, it's not as if Russia is going to sign on to the abolition movement. So we need policies that work in the real world as it is. And furthermore, right, the second level of debate, the in debate debate, learning the process of how policy is written and works in the world is important so we can be you'll hear this phrase a lot, better decision makers, better citizens in the world. The next argument on here is a framework argument. If you want to know more about framework, I'm going to be talking about it tonight in a selective. This is your time to shine. Framework is just the debate about debate. It's the meta debate part. So how should debate occur? An important argument to make when you're debating a K is that you should be able to weigh the affirmative against the K. This is important because the K is going to make arguments that maybe we should prioritize the debate space, for example. But you just like worked really hard on putting together a 1AC, that presumed fiat. So you want to make sure that that part of the debate, the debate about the hypothetical passage of the plan gets to be weighed in the judge's decision. Third thing, impact term. This is the same as NEDA. Ask approach in the world is not correct. Why do we have that? It's yeah, incorrect. Our approach to the world is correct. We already affirmed this. Sorry, I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, our approach to the world is correct. And so we should not endorse the way that they're saying, turn their impact. We do want to be careful about what impacts we decide to turn. Please do not say anything that is blatantly offensive or atrocious. Remember that. We can say that the axe approach to the world is correct without saying terribly offensive things. So what's an example of an impact turn in this case? Capitalism is good. Capitalism is good. Securitization is good. Russia is a threat. And we do got to deter them. We can say those things. <laughs> I'm allergic to bad impact turns, too. That's <laughs> so true. Um, Alt takeout, so the alternative doesn't solve, right? Alternative doesn't solve the impacts of the app. Nuclear war happens before we can do abolition. <laughs> um, and then if there are any like 
So there's like a few bad, tricky arguments in terms of the alt. We've already talked about floating picks. That's a place where you might make theory arguments about how floating picks get to co-op all of the hard work that goes into the affirmative <laughs> and make it like a sort of utopian version of the app that doesn't have a good approach to real world, which means that they should be rejected on that argument. Another thing that could happen are these things, well, that's all, is that the negative could forward an alternative that is vague. So for example, um, the alt could say something like, the alternative is uh, reject securitization. That means literally nothing. That like means nothing. What does that mean? What are we doing? What's the action? The reason why that's strategic for a negative team is because they get to, if they're not called out on it, could change it from speech to speech. So like in the one and see, they're like, the alt is reject securitization. They read like some sort of card. And then in the block, after they hear the answers to, in the two AC, right, that says securitization is good, it does these things, then they get to say, oh, rejecting securitization doesn't do the really good things. It's just an approach, or it's just does these things. They get to change what the alt is. So you can make a theory argument that says vague alternatives are bad because we don't know what we're debating, and they can use our offensive arguments against us. Yes. Uh, how specific does an alternative need to be, or like, what is the threshold to read a vague all bad kind of argument? Um, so I think in all alternative, we have like straight up a solvency advocate. That's like a pretty good okay. like yeah. way to do it. If in cross X, they say like you ask like, hello, what does the alternative do? And they're like, well, you know, it's like a sensibility. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You have to be, then that's a pretty good time to be like, we have literally no idea what the alt does. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> if you can't say what you're supposed to do after the round, it's probably made. Next, no matter what the debate is, well, no, I'll say that. Most of the time, 99% of the time, you should make some kind of perm argument. Remember, a permutation is a magical thing if you're affirmative because you get to convince the judge that they get to vote for both teams. <laughs> Look, judge, they have good ideas. So permutation is a magical third option in which the judge gets to say, I just love everybody's ideas. They were so good and I want to vote for all the teams. Judges love to vote on the perm. It takes like zero seconds to be like, I liked their ideas, but I also liked the affirmative. Great, I'll do it all. So you need to articulate a way that the permutation happens. So permutation is like a little story of how the thought process of desecuritization could still happen within the plan. There are also cards in the packet that will help you do this. So for example, a perm story with our app might be something like, like, we have to securitize Russia in order to, you know, we to stop them from attacking us, and then once we've stopped them from attacking us, you know, we we can solve peace, then we can stop securitizing people. Right, so like all of those cards that you already read that say that Russia will escalate if we do not put in red lines helps you articulate your current argument, right? We have already read cards that indicate that Russia will escalate no matter what, and so the, the alternative literally cannot happen until we do the plan. 
What's our favorite catchphrase? We gotta escalate to de-escalate, my friends. <laughs> Got to do it. All right, does that make sense? And then impact defense. Their impact doesn't happen. It's not real. Securitization Our, doesn't cause war. Securitization doesn't cause war. It actually stops war. Don't you have cards on the long piece? This is your time to shine. Sounds like that cross applies. Case to this question. Yes. Where's the link level on this? We should have had that on there. We don't have it. You're right, we don't. Uh, Our actually, actually no. It's, it is purposefully not on here because while you can and oftentimes should forward a no-link argument, you're probably not going to win it, which is something we're going to talk about on the next slide. <laughs> is it on this slide or is it on the next slide? It's on one of these slides. We it's got on, it. <laughs> but you're right. So basically the TLDR I'll give you right now is usually there is a link. Like, it might not be that good, but usually there is a link. So while you'll also forward a no link argument, I wouldn't rest your case on that. This is a good moment to remember the even if statements. So we don't think they have a link because, blah, blah, even though we're definitely securitizing. But let's say that you say it. Then you would even say, but even if they had the link, we still win on our impact outweighs, the permutation, whatever. Okay, so you need offense. So you have to win that case outweighs. Just write that little cute note for yourself on top of every speech. You need to make case outweighs arguments. If you do not get your case, you cannot win the debate. That's all you have, right? Um, I also love, Nick obviously wrote the slide. <laughs> Without the plan, death! Yeah, you wrote that part in. Oh, maybe I did. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, this is not my thing. Death. death! No education, the is bad, everything is on fire. So we won't be able to, so without the plan, right, you have like, you can depend on realism, util arguments, lots of people die through making the war. We're unable to learn about how international relations happen. That's really important for us to be better citizens in the world. And debate it isn't as useful as it could be. And then here are some things to just kind of think about. If you're reading a hard right app, so like hedge super good. Um, there's just no use in saying that the perm works because you can't like simultaneously de-secure like like stop securitizing in the in the world of the hard right app. They're going to win a link. Yeah. It, like it is. So to, to maybe counter, I guess, what we literally just said about the permutation, like, they are going to win that there's a link to the security mechanic. Okay? It's just, you're, you're not going to win a no-link argument. It's just, it, yeah. it's so, a losing battle. It is not the right move. So you need to be able to articulate how you win, even when there is a link. So case outweighs, extinction comes first, the alternative is really bad, causes bad things. Like nuclear war still happens, for example. Real bad. Nuclear war is awful. So bad. So bad. Yes. Um, does like a perm no link strategy work with a soft left kind of app? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yep. So case that ways still need it in a soft left app. The app should say that we do something that your alternative does not. So for example, like the importance of having a policy proposal that incorporates the ideas of the alternative. And the permutation, which we just talked about through like Nick's example of what the perm could be. You can, there can still be a link. 
and a permutation. You can have both of the things. Yes? I mean, all the times Meg use will stand up and, use, and say, like, every link has their disadvantage to the firm. Yeah. And that is something I have never either understood or really been able to say. This is great. This is a great cue. So when a team says every link is a disadvantage to the perm, what they're trying to say is that like the links somehow discredit the permutation. So like perpetuating the links is bad, and the permutation would necessarily have to do that. So you just basically have to say that doesn't matter. Like just basic like impact defense. You can kind of think of it this way, Parker. Remember, a permutation, a permutation is a test of whether we can combine the affirmative and the alternative. Right? Much like with the counter plan. It says we can do both the plan and the counter plan. Right? So it's not really a link question. It's a can we do both the good things that we've said are good? Right? There can still be links, and we can still do both those good things together. This yeah. also Sorry, this also side note is why I said before that one of the least persuasive moves when you're reading a critique is to just stand up and be like, I have all of my link work here, and then you separate the link from the impact work. It's because if you keep those links and those impacts separated from each other, it's way easier for you to stand up and be like, yeah, we link, but who cares? Yes. Okay, the last is just to be reasonable. For example, you cannot say that we are going to do abolition and the plan at the same time. That doesn't make any sense. We'd be abolishing the thing that's doing the plan. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah? Um, what's the difference between like off on the right and off on the left? I don't know what it means. Yeah, so a hard right app is like, trying to think of like, our app. Yeah, like our app is like, securitization good, deterrence really important. Soft left would be like, we should, uh, I'm like thinking about other topics, like we should do something like, nice. <laughs> I don't know, but with the state. So it's like, uh, like a, a lot of a lot of people read soft left apps last year on the water topic. So yeah, like we like, should protect this river because indigenous groups have rights to that river and it's important for their people. Or water should be a human right. Yeah. Like the that what would be an example for this do you think? For water should be a human right. No, 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 no. Oh, for this topic, like we should cooperate with NATO to develop new biotechnology that helps cure cancer. Right? Like cancer doesn't cause a planetary extinction. But it is still a bad thing that kills some people and makes a lot of people really sad. So I guess that that's, actually that's like the best way to think about like hard right versus like soft left apps is soft left apps usually don't get to nuclear war as an impact. Yeah. It's usually like economic equality as an impact. Oh, yes. You like your question? I was just gonna say like farming provide or vaccine provide. Yeah, vaccine. That's a good one too. Okay, so yeah. teaching. Good job. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Okay, La yeah, be reasonable. We love it. Okay, here's our K. Like the one that we were reading at camp. Did somebody just say, oh no? I hope not. <laughs> Get the 
same impact, incredible. So if we continue the cycle of securitizing, kind of like what Nick was saying with his example, we're going to continue to escalate to escalate, basically. It's basically questioning the premise of escalate to de-escalate as a thesis. It's saying eventually, as we start like, as we continue to up the ante, eventually there will be some sort of strike. Because like the best way to prevent you from dying is by killing the other people. So securitization inevitably, logically, ends with the enemy going away. That's the ultimate security, right? Yeah. Question. Oh yeah. So like, how would you run this case if how would you run this case in addition to like the is it the mutual restraint counter plan? So like, if if you're offering an all already and then like run a counter plan. How would that kind of like, how would they work? This is a great question. So, um, so as the negative, it is widely accepted as a norm, so it could be contested, as a norm, that you get to read different kinds of offense to test the app. They can, they don't have to all agree with each other. So, you can't go for both of them in the 2NR, but in the block, you could still use that and then decide which one has the best chance of winning, and then go for that in 2NR. Conditionality's good. Okay, those are good. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, what a, we talked about yesterday. It's a theory argument of conditionality. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so is there like a distinction between military terrorization and security or are they two similar? Well, so I think that to securitize, you need to militarize. But securitization is, did you say yes? Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. Um, I was like, wait, <laughs> are we going to have a throwdown right now? <laughs> um, so securitize means like that you're kind of keeping your borders and making sure that all of your people are safe. So it doesn't, so that can rationalize a lot of things like expansionism. But it usually doesn't refer to that. It refers to like, oh, we're going to make sure like our borders are good and safe, which means that we need to up our military to make sure that that happens. But militarization could also like lead to other things, like colonialization, for example. Yeah. You mentioned the escalate to deescalate strategy or doctrine. Does it say is this? I know the Russians have an escalate to deescalate doctrine, but uh, for like NATO and Western countries, is it kind of a norm, or is it rather like an established rule that that's what they're going to do? It's like a theory of military strategy, I would say. So they are going to do it in order to respond, but they make it known so that other people understand why they're doing it. Does that make sense? So if like suddenly like the United States was like, oh, here we're upping our arsenal like by a hundredfold, and they don't say that their policy is to escalate to de-escalate, then suddenly it looks like they're just about to escalate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is kind of on like the weight part. So I remember you mentioned earlier that a lot of K's are based off of, like epistemology and rhetoric, and what was right in the one AC. So how do we get from what was right in the round in the one AC to this huge external impact of nuclear war? So good. So let's first start with. Um, your question of what kind of K is this? What do we think? Yeah. The K part. Okay. Why? Uh, because we talk about like your discussions of cyber warfare. Right? Yeah. So the way that we talk about cyber warfare is securitizing. Good. We got anything else? I think that both of them are right. So also the ways that, remember when we talked about like governmentality, the ways that we come to know how to interact with the state also make securitization of common logic. It's like the first rational thing we'd want to do. Like, oh, Russia might come to war with us. Well, then we need to make sure that our um, all kinds of borders, including cyber, are secure because we can see that they're escalating. So we need to make sure that that happens. So it's questioning both the logic and the way that we talk about things. Good. Um, can I also add in to add to this? 
I think something that is implicit within this kind of critique, and I think implicit within epistemology and writer case generally, is that the way that we talk about the world, or the way that we come to understand how the world works, influences the actions that actually happen. So, if this policy were to be proposed to Congress for these reasons, the policy that gets enacted is one that has the material effect of causing nuclear war. Like a rough reality kind of thing? Basically. I hate the term reps, but yes, that's about right. <laughs> the way we talk about it manifests in the actions that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You could say that, but the smart native team would say, but every instance that we reinforce it makes it more and more of a reality. So we need to reject it in every instance, and we're rejecting it now in the instance of the affirmative. Did we get over there? Everybody feel good? Okay. What's our plan? What's our plan for what? Just are we now reading cards? Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go over some cards real quick. Okay. Did we talk about the alt? Oh, the alt is, I think it's abolition, isn't it? Yeah, it's abolition. So, instead of securitizing, let's desecuritize. <laughs> let's do the opposite thing of what you're doing. Do not do that. The alt card um, is attached to a very specific movement, so you have a pretty good solvency advocate, which is good. Um, so it's not just like, <laughs> and the alternative is like, don't, don't do that thing. It's, don't do that thing in this way. Yes? So it's not like abolish NATO, or? I don't think it's abolish, it's abolish all militarization. Uh, and then I think there's a part that says NATO should do like nice things. I think that the actual text of the card would defend abolishing NATO. Um, it's not in our tag. And so I think if you want to be a, weird, fun cativator, I would in cross-examination not defend abolishing NATO, but then decide later on if you're actually going to or not. That could be a result of the alternative, yeah. would be a way I'd say it. Okay, let's put this in context. Okay, this is not Mater narrative. Read this as master narrative. It's <laughs> not Cars <laughs> too. Uh, I don't know what happened, but I loved it. Okay. So the master narrative of cybersecurity as an existential threat moves power to the state. Cyber politics becomes war by other means. What kind of argument is this? Link, so smart, so good. Okay. So I'm just going to read through it, and then we can chat about it to make sure we understand. Well, let's just first talk about the tag. Master narrative of cybersecurity. Okay, so now cybersecurity is a master narrative in this case. Is an existential threat. What's an existential threat? It's really bad. Huge impact, yes. Moves power to the state. So the master narrative of cybersecurity makes it so the state has more power. And cyber politics becomes war by other means. What does that mean? Why would that be important? Yes. Like when it says war by other means, it may be like referring to like instead of like a cyber war, it's like oh, it's gonna escalate to like an in-person war, or like like a war by different means, or like a physical war, or like a nuclear war. It's like inherently worse because like. If you're sending nukes at each other, it's probably worse than a cyber app. So you're right in the sense that that is a result of the app, but I think that this thing is actually kind of saying the opposite of your thing, which is to say that now war isn't just war in that sense of like nuclear war troops on the ground. We're extending war into a new territory, which is cyberspace. Does that make sense? So like war wasn't there before, but now it is because of the master narrative of cybersecurity. Okay, so here's our card. So cybersecurity is characterized as fearful and inevitable. Cybersecurity was positioned as a threat, 
internal experts were positioned as guards. Okay, why is this part important? Think about knowledge power. Who gets to create the knowledge which creates the power? Yes. Institutions. Institutions. Okay, so now we're identifying the institution that's in power here, right? Which are the people that are in charge of cybersecurity. Suddenly they're experts. We look to them to decide what we ought to do. Good. Governments maintain a state of permanent cyber emergency. So that's a kind of knowledge, right? This could be exaggeration or fabrication. Permanent emergency offers a master narrative. We already know about that, yes? That can be invoked to justify restrictive controls, such as surveillance. Positioning cybersecurity as warfare establishes that concept in the minds of all parties to that war. So everybody is now in on it. It's not just the United States, but everybody invests in that master narrative. Focusing on attack and defense lead to unintended consequences, state, purchase, state purchasing of vulnerabilities. Positioning cybersecurity as an existential threat allow for exceptionalism and deviance. So like we kind of, what, another master narrative is American exceptionalism, right? So like suddenly we're the special ones that need to con continue. Both national and supranational. Exceptionalism based on existential threat can be observed in modern societies, including cybersecurity threats. Fear propels citizens into the waiting arms of whoever might be ruling. So we need to de depend on our government to make sure that we are safe. So we're going to imbue them with more power so that they can keep us safe. Fear may be a necess necessity justification for power. It is straightforward to conceive of such justification as a function of interstate crisis, particularly with threats that are hard to understand, such as cybersecurity. So this just is saying those that have the knowledge of cybersecurity get to make those decisions. Like you and I, unless you're maybe you're much smarter than me, I don't doubt it. But I know nothing about cybersecurity. I do not tell you anything about how that works. And so suddenly all of my trust is in experts and they can determine what kind of policies are passed without my knowledge, right? Because I have no idea. Blah, blah, blah. All right, words in cybersecurity discourse, now we're talking about rhetoric, right? May carry encoded ideologies, master narrative, that maintain power structures, right? This is the power knowledge stuff from before. References to nat nation state along cyber threat carry an association of war being waged by established enemies of the West, also master narrative. Such references maintain hegemonic power. By assigning a moral dimension to cybersecurity, citizens may be discouraged from challenging the need for intrusive controls associated with it. Cyber, specialist cybersecurity language provides power to those that can understand it. And interpretation provides an opportunity to imbue translation with meanings. Language is a means by which reality is experienced and constructed, which is what? Okay. Rhetoric. Rhetoric. So smart and so good. Those who have power to interrupt have the power to construct reality, or interpret, sorry, have their power to construct reality. Cybersecurity may offer a channel through which beliefs can be established and maintained. Cybersecurity abounds with military tropes, which is what? Militarism. Militarization happening right here. The perception of always being at war from cybersecurity perspective may be motivated by a masculine desire for various narratives, demonstrating masculinity through met metaphor and bravado. More link to rhetoric. All right. Securitized governmentality justifies extinction in the name of saving life. What kind of argument is that? Yeah. It's an impact. Here, here's the big word, my peeps. We love it. Extinction is coming. All right. There was a parallel between disciplinary power. You now know about it, right? What's disciplinary power? When institutions take power for 
sorry. You're very close, yes. Is it when people, um, they take it upon themselves to like act a certain way? Yes, we, we do certain things because we're taught to and we know that there are repercussions. Good. Uh, and security. So there's a relationship between disciplinary power and security. Security became an insistent and relentless international preoccupation for humankind. Systems of security incarcerate rather than liberate, radically endanger rather than make safe. So we are trapped within our own logics of security. And engender fear rather than assurance. So this argument is saying more talk of security, more scared we are. Which it should be the opposite, right? If we're secure, we shouldn't be freaked out all the time. But this argument is saying the opposite is actually happening. By rendering the future terrestrial existence conditional, calculations of governmentality must be, this is a Klarman highlighted card, <laughs> seems to, for, thank you, seems to furnish a new predicate of global, that has to be life, and the advent of human extinction. We're going to fix this highlight. <coughs> By we are, I mean you. Okay, so we're getting to human extinction. So the more we talk about security, the more freaked out we are, more likely it is that we use, like, nuclear weapons to make sure that we are safe and that other people can't attack us first. You good? All right, last card. It, as Alice Harper would say, is a chonker. <laughs> the alternative is abolition, reject militarized framing that responds to threats with violence for a movement of international solidarity. What kind of card is this? Oh. Alternative. So good. All right. Action is needed to prevent future armed conflict and nuclear war. Right? We're like solving the impact. We're starting, we're starting with the solvency. Instead of opposing military alliances, parties should engage in building a common, demilitarized security strategy. This is the Chris A question. NATO should be disbanded, non-militarized. Alliances should be built with international solidarity. Countries should reduce their military spending and agree to phased reductions. All countries should join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and work for the elimination of all nuclear weapons. Elimination of weapons could be pursued through a verifiable process. The process of nuclear weapon abolition could provide a path to changes in the world order. Establishing new cooperative paradigm and free of resources. Address the climate crisis. We must put care for the planet above military, political, and economic interests. A people-centered peace process is imperative. Without this, exclusion will not be remedied and um, pain and injustice will turn into alienation, so it's like, it's bad for the planet, it's bad for people, yeah? We need a paradigm shift, there's our magic word. Stemming from this kind of people-centered peace process, we need to dismantle the militarized global order, militarized conceptions of security, and dominance of military, uh, military industrial complex. An abolitionist framing is used for, useful for cultivating such transformation. Instead of investing in weapons and preparing for war, we must invest for people and planet. Abolition is a tool to build a world for all. The abolition of war requires disarmament. What's that? Getting rid of our like demilitarizing, like taking away weapons that people don't really need. Yeah, so like people willingly giving up their like nuclear weapons, other kinds of weapons. Yeah. Unlearning that unlearning, so this is a big one, right? Because of epistemological, right? Unlearning. Yeah. Uh, I'm noticing you talked about how we need to shift from human centered problem solving to more like a planet focus. So is that maybe a critique of humanism or like critiquing? Uh, yes. Yeah. And I think it would also be a critique of util. Unlearning the necessity of violence is essential, turning on its head much of what we are taught about safety and security, learning to reject violence as a solution. It's a pretty good alt card. It's pretty good. Yeah. Do we have any, it says like we are follow along the Ukrainian peace movement. And yeah, it's just like a very specific movement. I, do we have 
of the game background and all those other things, but that is. So I feel like it has to be one of those things where you like read it and then it's like, that's a Nazi movement. <laughs> I don't think it's Nazi movement. I don't think it's a Nazi movement, <laughs> but, wrong, but... Probably not. Yeah, but that would be like a good thing to research. I obviously didn't highlight it. But, yeah, because I didn't think it was like super important. The website's tag is Ukraine No to War Resist All Militarism. So. Feels good. Feels good. Yes. Could you go back up to the tag so I can see that one? Yes. This is also in your file. So. Okay. Not that I highlighted the first and third card for today, so you'll have to do that. And you'll fix the second highlighting because the sentences don't make sense. Okay. So this is just like the one in C. Obviously there are like more things that you can read, but I just wanted to make it, I just wanted to kind of give you like an overview of what the critique is. Does anybody have any questions? Feelings, yes. So uh, on the alternative, who are we arguing like does the abolition? Because it kind of felt like saying every nation like agrees to disarm. I feel like that's utopian fiat. So, if like I wanted to read this on the negative, what should I say about like who is abolishing like the securitization? I think you would say that the United States would. I don't think you get everybody would. I think you get to say like the United States would sign on to this, but also you would make like the in round argument as well that we should also align ourselves with such a movement and make demands on the state. Yeah. Um, I'm, I still don't really understand this, but for, if the affirmative is arguing against the status quo, why don't they, like, pick out, like, a master narrative out of the status quo and, like, use that? Can they use that? Because I thought, like, critiques were mostly for negative, so couldn't some of this stuff brought up today also be used by the affirmative? I'm not quite following. So what? So what could be used by the affirmative? Like, um, like for like paradigm shift, they have like a fundamental change in approach or underlying assumptions. Mm -hmm. So then, is it the affirmative also arguing for a fundamental shift, or? Um, I don't think that they're they're. I think that the negative argument would be that the affirmative is continuing on a path of like our current paradigm, which is to securitize. So they would say, like, I don't think in the world of the affirmative that, would, that it would lead to abolition. Obviously, they'll make arguments that say that it could happen that way. But I think that the argument of the negative is to say, you're perpetuating militarism and securitization, which is bad. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I also add real quick? I don't know if this quite answers your question or not, but not all master narratives are bad, and not all governmentality is bad. So, like, wash your hands. <laughs> like, please, love of God, wash your hands. Like, that is an instance of governmentality, maybe to some extent a master narrative. Right? So, don't automatically think these things are bad. Like, obviously, the critique would say that these particular master narratives are bad. But. Yeah. Yeah. I could be wrong about this, but I think a uh, weak point in the alternative part is uh, the fact that the U.S. Uh, abolishes security, but doesn't really, I don't know if you said, doesn't really say other countries do. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially against this act, I think as an act, you just easily say, like, Russia doesn't be securitized, and it just makes the U.S. weaker, and uh, Russia attacks even more. And I think that that's a great answer. So that so basically, what he just said is that by desecuritization or by desecuritizing and doing the alternative, we leave ourselves vulnerable to Russia, which means that like inevitably we all die from nuclear war and that happens. So yeah, I think that's a great answer. Is there anything I could say against that? Yeah, you would say. It's that very logic that perpetuates our need to continuously build up our arsenal, which we have argued 
is what makes nuclear war happen, not the de-escalation. Yeah. Oh, last but not least, let's talk briefly about K affirmatives. Not at this camp, but in real life. Sometimes the affirmative could say something like, we are going to reject the topic, the norm of debating the topic, because we think that the logic of the topic itself is bad. If you want to talk more about how you would answer that as a policy team, you should come to my selective this evening, where we're going to talk about framework. Makes the game work. Makes the game work. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, I don't think there's anything to that right now. No. Like you all should be aware that chaos exists is a thing that you will likely debate against. And they always question the norm of the resolution being debated. And if you are unfamiliar with how to debate against them, uh, with retweet, you should go to say it's selected. Okay. Anything else? Oh, really? Any other questions? Feelings? Thoughts? Yes. Okay. So if you're going for the thing, how much time do you need to put into like going for it in your remote? This, I mean, it really depends on the round. I've seen some people <laughs> take like. Case in the K in the 2 and C, or the 1 in R takes the K. It just depends on what you want to do. Um, I always like in the block that you should have like potentially three. Hey, don't pack up yet. Come on. We're still talking. Things talking. You should have potentially three avenues for winning. So like let's say that the 1AR, because then that's like really important because once the 1AR goes, you can pivot pretty easily. And so, um, so you just want to really think about like what you're ahead on, what you could get more ahead on, but have backup plans in case like everything goes terribly wrong in the one AR. Anything else?